you're going to need to use Spanglish. And I was like, no, well, I'm going full Spanish. <laughs> like, so it was a tough one. <laughs> How did it go? I mean, overall. At first, he, and this was a, so it's a couple. The husband had mentioned to me that he didn't want to buy a property right now. He wanted to wait for the prices to drop down. And then after we talked last night, he was like, all right, Angela, next weekend, we're at minimum six properties if we're driving over there and let's get in a contract. I was like, okay. Nice. I did tell him, happy wife, happy life. Like, trust right. me, buddy. Like, I know that works. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, good. Actually, um, uh, I was touring some new developments over in Stockton over the last couple of weeks. And uh, this young couple still in their, you know, late 20s picked their lot got to pick all their upgrades and just to be a part of that process and then you know to go stand on their land and it was it was really cool I haven't had much much experience with the new devs and obviously that's becoming the norm <laughs> and so uh yeah Terry you're absolutely it was it was a really cool experience and like you know I got to understand what the lot premiums were and how they pick all their upgrades and uh, it's through KB Homes, and uh, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful new development out in Stockton, and it was uh, it was a fun experience, really, really fun experience. Now, yeah. and they do, they say again, Angela. Do they have to do an appraisal when you do a new build? I, it's super random, but I've never done one, so. So they still do an appraisal, but what happens is that it's so this project is their home will be completed in seven months, uh -huh. but. Um, just last week alone, the prices went up for this, the base price, $7,000. So their rate is locked. And so by the time that their house is finished, the starting model or starting homes in that area will probably be right around 520. So they're going to have instant equity as soon as they yeah, walk in. So I, mean for today? I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm getting some so feedback. Fred, can you get your phone? I did it. Never mind. <laughs> Yeah, but it was a really, really cool experience to be a, to 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 be able to be there with them and walk them through that process. Um, hey, Elias, do you know where in Stockton it was? Um, yeah, it was right off of Eight Mile Road. It was called oh, yeah. um, KB Homes at Verona. Um, so they have Santorini, but Santorini is not available until June, the sales center. But man, it is going quick. We went out to the uh, Dr. Horton the week before. They had eight releases. And for the eight releases, they had 100 offers, 100 offers for eight releases. Wow. So it's, it, you know, before it was, it was a little less competitive with new builds. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to start having, we're going to have a discussion around that. Maybe I do a, a Friday training and maybe like people like Terry and, and people like, like uh, Christina that have a lot of experience um, dealing with new devs. There's one made for you already. I'm curious. Um, so I, I think we'll do like a little session on that. The other one tasted weird. Um, so let's give it a couple more. Sorry, I made a whole pot of coffee, but for some reason it just tasted weird. I don't know if it's the coffee or what, but it tasted weird. It might anyway. be just you. Just you. I'm just kidding. Perhaps, perhaps. Maybe I'm too cynical about the taste of my coffee. Uh, but actually, I, I like all coffee. All right, we'll get oh, wait, started. So these new builds were in Stockton? Yeah, it is and crazy. So offers in Stockton? Totally. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's great. And it's wild to think like this. So you're standing out in front of this new development and this is where I saw, I saw Pamela and Michael out there and you're looking out this great wide expand, right? And in the distance, the Delta is there. Well, you see all these earth movers and water trucks that are going back and forth and back and forth and really like designing and, and, and setting the course of what's going to come. And it's crazy to think like Stockton, it's not the most, hasn't always been the most desirable areas. But what happens is that when the Bay Area comes with their money and with their, you know, um, jobs and, and, and things that they like from food and stuff like that, they bring that with. So you start seeing like new restaurants and new style of, of, of places develop and like, like communities emerge and then like they're building lakes in the distance. It's really, really cool to see. But yeah, the Bay Area is causing this influx everywhere. So builders are coming up right now. Builders are coming up. So there was the, the guy, and we'll, we'll get into coaching in just a minute, but the guy was there. At one time, he had nine people pull up, and he wasn't able to talk to him. Nine people walking, hey, can I see a mono? Can I see a mono? Oh, it's by appointment only, appointment only. So, yeah, it was wild. It's it's out in Stockton, and it is, uh, it's is—it's everywhere. Every single new build that I've heard of is crazy, crazy busy. So um, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Good morning, everyone. How the heck are you? Everyone good? 
Good, good, good. Um, I see, oh, Chris is here. Okay, Chris, how's the baby doing, man? Chris just had a newborn, and I know that he, I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks. So, Chris, how's the baby? Thanks. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Yeah, the baby's doing doing well. Can't complain. Yeah, we're very grateful that he's healthy because he came a little bit early. So, um, well, congratulations, man. So, how, what what is his name? His name is Andrew Nicholas. Andrew Nicholas. Very cool. And he was how how many weeks early? Uh, four weeks. Four weeks. Okay. Four and so, weeks. how much did he weigh when he was born? Six pounds two ounces. Okay, Just for for being a month early, he's still healthy. Yeah, yeah. Good for I'm you, bad. bro. Good yeah. for you, man. So how's your sleep so far? How are you doing? How's mom doing? <laughs> What's sleep? Um, <laughs> we're doing good. We're doing good. We're, we're hanging on by a thread. <laughs> yeah, man, but, I get uh, it. And, but you have other ones. You've been through this before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I remember. Not nearly I remember as bad as the first one. I feel like our, our first kid, she didn't sleep at all. So. Yeah, I remember that with Silas, just like, You'd get up and then like the the phone asleep and like oh you don't want to drop him right and like yeah. you're, you're but <laughs> yeah and then we yep. finally slept for like seven hours and I'm like oh my god thank you but now the boy sleeps eight hours by himself in his own bed so uh, congratulations yeah. man are you in our office up there in Sacramento or are you at your home office yeah yeah I just got in to the okay, office cool. here in so Sac so you guys know if you're ever up in the Sacramento area connect with Chris we have a co-working space up there that if you ever want to go and work out of that space it's pretty cool I heard it's yeah it's, it's sweet great location there's you know shopping and restaurants and stuff just downstairs awesome awesome well congratulations my man you look good despite not having too much sleep so uh <laughs> Congratulations to you. You could see the smile all over your face, bro. So congratulations to you and your lady. Uh, PK, what happened to your hand? Oh, it's so annoying. Carpal tunnel. Oh, really? Dang it. I don't even know like how it's possible at my age, but they said it is possible. And here we are. <laughs> oh, that sucks. That's sucks. So I, um, I found a way to not have carpal tunnel. And uh, I learned this a long time ago. So I type like this. So I think it just keeps it really, really loose instead of this way. So this has really helped me. Like Jen makes fun of me. She says I'm the loudest typer ever, but no, no risk problems at all. Uh, <laughs> all right, guys. So I wanted to ask a quick question. And I know that there's some athletes on the line and, and it looks like Pamela, she's out there riding her bike already. I love it. I love it. Pamela is on a tear right now. She has a goal. She wants to lose a certain amount of weight. She's focused on her fitness. I love it. And look at her still on the call. So I want to ask a quick question to everybody. Um, does anybody on the call know who Roger Bannister is? Has anyone ever heard that name? Uh, so Kevin, so who is Roger Bannister? He's a runner. Uh, he wasn't, was he the first four minute miler? Totally. Yeah. So, so Roger Bannister in 1954 was the very first person on earth recorded to ran the four minute mile. He actually ran the, the mile in 30 minutes, 59 seconds, 0.4, right? So he was the very first recorded human on earth to run the four minute mile. Prior to that, everyone said that that was not possible, that the human was not possible and not capable of running a four minute mile. He ran the four minute mile and in less than two years, 37 other people ran the four minute mile. Now, um, you know, as, as all these years have gone by, over 1400 people have ran the four, four minute mile. And I think about that. I've ran a mile in, in, in eight minutes. I've ran a mile in seven and a half minutes and that kicks your ass, right? That kicks your ass, it's a hard run. But to do that in four minutes, it's just, crazy I remember being in school in like middle school and there was always like these three dudes I would run like a six minute mile and I'm like cutting corners and like kicking dirt and I'm like hey this is my walking and like I never knew how they did it but um I, I thought that was a really really cool story to start off with this morning because um a, a four minute mile and then afterwards for that many people to do that in two years why do you think so many people were then able to do that within a very short amount of time anyone want to chime in on that Go ahead, Damien. One more time, sir. Because they knew it was possible. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. They, they saw someone else do that and they, and they knew what was possible 
and and it it changed people's mindset right i think i saw angela pointing to this right it's that nobody believed nobody believed that it was possible and sometimes they needed to see it happen and then they started to believe anyone else want to chime in on that you guys are easy this morning Elias, competition Jay. okay jay i heard competition jay well, that, was, that was somebody else sorry okay who spoke first? Oh, that was me. Okay, go ahead, Jacob. I was just saying the competition. Once, Not only did they see that it was able to be done, but now these other people want to do it as well. Totally. You know, they want to be the next, uh, the next person to do it or beat him. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Jay, what were you going to say? Uh, were you reading Stephen Kotler's book? Um, no, I wasn't, but you know what? I, I actually came across it, but it's it's something that I remember Tony Robbins doing a speech about years and years and years ago. And I just, obviously, I, I thought about it in the middle of the night. And so I wanted to talk about it today. What I want to share with the group, who Stephen Kotler is and why I'm asking, is he researches the concept of flow, which I know Patrick mentioned last week, the idea of flow states and peak states, which uh, Elias is living. I'm just going to say that from my, my obje subjective opinion. Uh, the idea here is there are these, that there are a group of people on the planet who are doing things that were once thought to be impossible. And a very intriguing thing happens is soon after it becomes normal to do it. Uh, he talks also about, this author talks about snowboarders. Uh, I'm going to just make up the number. Something like a 50 foot gap was once the highest amount of clearance that a snowboarder was able to hit and it was just thought to be impossible to go any farther i'm not a snowboarder so i'm getting my details and i'm just fudging for the conversation something like in 1994 95 some snowboarder hits over 50 and then within like three years someone's hitting 250 so five times that amount of gap uh so what i'm extrapolating what i want to learn is that once you see that these these boundaries these walls not only can you climb over them not not only can they be broken, you can actually hit like an exponential amount of growth over that. You can kill it even harder. It's just a matter of believing that it's possible to get through it. And that's what these professional and extreme athletes have shown, that these human limitations are in fact mental only. Man, I absolutely, absolutely love that. So you guys, I'm gonna draw, draw a quick little diagram here for you. So do you think that that Roger Bannister changed the way that he trained? Do you think that he changed his habits? What do you think changed in order for him to truly, truly get there? I mean, obviously you can do all the work, you can do all the training that you want, but like, what was one thing that you think he got really, really in alignment with? Like, what's a word that you think that, that really defined what he did? I think it was his goal, like having some sort of a clear vision and a goal that he was going to train for. Yep. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, so the word that came out of this for me was certainty, right? He went from complete uncertainty to saying, I can train all day long, right? I could put in the hours. I can, you know, take the action every single day. I can, because I know I have the potential. I'm a God gifted athlete. I uh, running's in my blood, blood. I know that I have the potential, but what he changed is he changed his belief that it can be done, right? His body followed suit, right? He knew that if he changed his mindset, that his body was going to follow suit because he had all the potential in the world to do so. And so his body was able to help them, him along. It's just like marathon runners. And if any of you have ever ran a marathon, and I know that um, um, uh, Pamela has done multiple marathons, but that point too, it's all here, right? Your body can do it. But, but I've talked to people, they're like at mile 16, mile 18, I was done. I was done. And then I had to get right here in order for me to keep pushing along. And I think that's what Roger Bannister did. I think that Roger Bannister didn't change all of his patterns because it was obviously working for him. He was an a, a athlete, but he changed his belief. And so I wrote this diagram here for you guys. And so it's just really sloppy, but it's okay. So if you guys can see it here, um, let's see. All right, so it's P for potential, A is for action, R is for results, and then you have the 
Um, B is for beliefs. A lot of times what we think is that, okay, well, if I change my actions, I'm going to get the results and maybe those results will, will change my belief. Well, it's not, we've all done that before, right? We've all had those instances where that really didn't necessarily work. So when we talk about conditioning the mind and getting really prepared, you have to think about it this way. Why is visualization so important? If you guys want a certain type of car, then you guys need to be looking at that car every single day. Why do vision boards work? Because it becomes part of your reality, right? I'm speaking these things into existence. I am going to have this. I am going to do this. This is what I am going to create in my life. I am going to read success magazines because all I want to do is fill my mind with everything that's going to help me achieve what I want to accomplish in here first, right? So that's why people say, put your goals somewhere that you could see them. Put a vision board right over your bed. Um, I was reading the story about this millionaire. He's like, he was working at a uh, blockbuster back in the days and he would always bring an auto trader and he would look at the Porsche he was going to buy. And people would be like, dude, what are you doing? You work at fucking blockbuster. Why are you looking at this Porsche? He's like, because I'm going to have this Porsche. So I'm prepping for the Porsche that I want to buy and I'm, I'm going to choose the right one. And then Abel in his mid twenties to pull up in this Porsche, even when his boss told me, you should probably not do that to yourself. Don't do that yourself because you're going to hurt yourself. And so I, I was thinking about this in, in all kinds of different levels of our business and personal life as well. So I wanted to go around the room and I want to ask a question. What is there, has there been a time in your life, in your personal life, in your career, in things that you've done in your life where you felt a sense of true certainty and then you were able to accomplish something and you walked in like, dang, and you're still that way right now. It is something you do in your life that you do with absolute certainty. And I was thinking about this in, in, in my own head. So two things that I know that I, when I do it, I do it with absolute certainty. First one is, is and, and these are just two, snowboarding. And I'm glad somebody brought that up. When, when you get off that lift and I'm up on the top of the mountain, there's no hesitation, right? I pick my lane. I know where I'm going. I know I'm going to make my turns. I'm counting in my head. I'm going one, two, three, carve, one, two, three, carve. I'm going to go through that tree, that tree, that tree. I'm going to jump off that. There's no certainty. There's no second guessing. I'm out there and I'm going to, I'm going to conquer this mountain. That's how I feel. People are like, dude, you're so fast on the mountain. It's like, no, man, I, I just know. I like know that I'm going to conquer this mountain and I feel a sense of certainty. Other thing is, is driving fast. I love driving fast, but I don't drive fast recklessly, right? It's like, I feel like I, I know the lanes. I know where I'm going to go. Like, I feel a sense of certainty that I'm in full control. I understand you guys, people, things happen, the accidents happen. But those are two things, like, when I step on it, like, I feel like I'm in full fucking control, right? And so I want to ask you guys, what are some things that you have done in your career that you could say, you know what, I do this with absolute certainty and conviction. I want to hear from you guys because... This is how we learn from each other, and I'm sure you all have something. So I want to go to Jacob because, um, you know, Jacob is, uh, if you guys don't know, he's a, he's a skateboarder. So Jacob, like, what are things that you do that you're absolutely certain about in your life? Definitely skateboarding. Skateboarding definitely got me a lot of my confidence as far as, because uh, you can't be, like, there's no halfway. You're on it. It's in control. So you have to be all in. And so I just try to apply that when I'm, like, when I'm making calls, I call, I try to just get that energy, the confidence of this person is going to want to buy. And then just having that mindset kind of works a lot of the time. I mean, sometimes, you know, it doesn't always work out. People hang up. But having that confidence when I'm calling and that thinking that it is going to work out sometimes works out a lot better than you would plan instead of like trying to fumble. And it helps you get in that mindset of having the right words and moving forward and getting mm -hmm. into a flow, I guess. Totally. I love that. Because if I know that that through one of these calls, I'm going to reach $30,000. I'm going to reach somebody that wants to buy or sell real estate. And I am, I believe so much instead of being like, oh, they said no again. Yeah. I knew it. I knew they were going to say no to me. What does that do to my belief? Well, my belief is like, shit, I knew I wasn't that good on the phones, right? No, I believe with certainty and conviction, if I make enough calls, I have enough skill to get somebody that wants to meet me and buy or sell real estate. I'm going to keep trucking along. Right. So I like that, Jacob. And and Jacob, I'm sure you've jumped off some cool shit. I'm sure you've rode some rails. I'm sure you've done some tricks that if you didn't believe that you could do that, then you were going to fall on your ass. Right. Oh, and you're falling on your ass the whole time, too. And it's just all about getting back up and keep trying. Like, I feel like skateboarding is really the biggest perseverance sport because like snowboarding, you're strapped in. So there's you have to have the utmost confidence. 
for skateboarding, you have to commit to staying on your skateboard. You can kick it away all you want, but if you want to roll away at the end, you have to commit to that. You might fall. You probably will. You get back up and you try it again. Mm, yeah. Because on a skateboard, you could just say, you know what? I'm just going to walk this out. I'm yeah, out, definitely. Right. Wow. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a really good analogy, man. Like, like to even think about it that way. Um, who else? Let's go to uh, Ronnie. I think Ronnie raised his hand. Ronnie, let's go over to you, man. What is something in your life that you do or have done that you do with absolute certainty and conviction? It's so funny when you ask this question, I didn't even know how to answer it. And then till you made it clear. So I used to, when I was 21, I actually worked for a construction building company in Florida. So I used to be the guy that you talk to when you buy your homes at DR Horton. And we talk about what do you want change? So I did that for two years and then I studied fashion, obviously. And I feel like now, I always tell people, I feel like, uh, I think Barbara Corcoran talked about it. She said she had like 21 jobs or something in her, her whole entire life. So I feel like every job that I've had have contributed to anything that I've done till up to this date. So let's just say when I go to a house and my clients like couldn't visualize it. And I said, oh yeah, you just put up, you know, turn this wall down, you can put this, turn this kitchen into this, you know, add the window over here, you know, and all these kind of things, which for them, they couldn't visualize it. But I feel like if you describe it with confidence, and luckily I have a little bit background in construction, so, and design, so it kind of helps me to navigate that. But I do have to be careful sometimes when I read clients, because some of them might not be, do, don't want to do that whole big construction thing, so. I had to keep it either on a small scale unless they want to do a full remodel. So I think from, and I also did a reality show. So they, they throw you in a loop where like this, okay, we're going to, well, for lack of better words, we're going to fuck up Ronnie's rhythm because, you know, I'm, I'm in a zone, but they're going to try to throw you uh, some obstacles. But I'm like this, if your plan B, that plan A doesn't work, plan B, plan C, plan D, whatever. But I, I noticed some contestants were crying. And I'm like, your plan A didn't work, so you just started crying. I'm like, where's your plan B? Plan B doesn't work. So I think at that point, the producers gave up on throwing shit at me because I'm just going to try to figure it out, you know, and Anna Wintour did something I think in one of her, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie, the September issue, the September issue. Yeah. And they ask her what's her biggest uh, or her uh, biggest trait that she loved about herself. And she said, it's being decisive. And I feel like we have to be somewhat like, in, you know, and I try to be like that because at the end of the day, you know, because people rely on us you know, to make decisions. And, and I'm doing it this weekend. And even though I get ter I'm a little bit terrified because we submitted an offer. <laughs> I mean, the seller's dragging at the moment because I think they're waiting for another offer, even though we submitted a great offer. So I I'm just trying to push for it and hopefully we get into contract today. Uh, but yeah, it's I think at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we try to implement everything that we've learned throughout our lives, yeah. the jobs that we've had. And then, you know, and it's been working so far. Good stuff, Ronnie. I love it. Patrick, how about for you, man? What is something that you have done or do with absolute certainty and conviction? So, oh, first of all, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, my stuff's been acting weird, uh, weird today. Um, anything, you know, it's funny because I feel like my brain clicks into accessing that like full, like as close to full 100% volume when I absolutely cannot let something fail. Um, and so getting into the mind state of having the stakes be that high for things that I need to get done is probably the biggest challenge. <clears throat> but so for example, I used to, uh, I was a creative director on this um, festival called Night on Broadway. And it took place in LA and it was like 120,000 people were gonna show up. And it was over five blocks and five different theaters. And wow. so because our team was pretty bootstrapped for that big of a festival, there was a lot of pressure. And if you screwed up, the exposure was to the tune of 120,000 people. And so by the, by, frankly, fear is the most powerful motivator in my life, whether that's good or bad. And so whenever I have the conviction of knowing that it's on my shoulders and there's no one else and I've got to do it, 
I think that's when I snap into this mentality where I am unflappable. Like I, I must be the, the, the pillar because I am the last line of defense. And mm. so it's almost not like what task do I do where I am, you know, immovable. It's more of what are the stakes that require me to get there most of the time? Because, mm. you know, you're going to run into variables constantly with anything you do. But if you, if you put yourself, if you are put in a position in which you cannot step off your square or the team loses, um, that's a situation where I usually uh, will, will step up and be immovable. Man, I, I absolutely love that. And I appreciate you guys having this conversation with me. I really do. Because I think Patrick brought up something, you know, that's really important here. So we're, we're, we operate in two different ways. We can either operate from a fear of loss right? That's what's going to motivate us or hope for gain, right? We can operate from a place where I have this burning desire to succeed and win, or I fucking hate losing so bad, right? It's like, which way are you pulled in your mind? Like, I can't stand losing, right? Like, so, so Jen's a lot like that. Jen is, is the point where it's like, she hates to lose then more than she likes to win. She's an athlete. She comes from a basketball background, right? And so I, I, you know, communicating with her, I can see how her mind operates. Like she just fucking hates to lose. <laughs> she, she hates to lose and that pushes and pushes and pushes. So I love what you guys are saying, because think about this. Patrick could have all the potential in the world. He could have all the actions in the world um, or, or he could know what his results going to be, but he has minimal action in order for him to get there. And he's not doing all the work behind the scenes. So then his belief is, oh, this event didn't go well because, you know, look at what happened. It was a failure. But he believes so hard. He obviously has the potential. He does the, all the actions. And the, so the results are, I'm going to have this cool event that is super, super successful. So I like how you guys are thinking. Cynthia, how about for you? What's something in your life that you can walk into and absolutely do with certainty and conviction? Um, negotiation. Okay, let's, okay. let's talk about it. Yeah, negotiating for my clients and just being there like Patrick was saying, being the pillar and being like, no, I have got this for you. And I think that in the beginning, you have to show that because I tell my clients all the time in the beginning, I don't tell them in the beginning, I tell them for you in front of you, I may show up as a kitten, but when it comes to representing you, I am the lion. And mm. there's a very firm, different line between that. Just yesterday, I was doing a final walkthrough and holes all over the house, holes, like holes in doors and wasn't in the avid, wasn't in the home inspection. So clearly these are new holes. And I told yep. my clients, you're not buying this home like this. If you don't want to buy this home because there are these new issues, you don't have to. There are new issues here and the confidence that I brought to that conversation and they knew I have their back. They knew that I was going to negotiate and get these things fixed that I came home so high off of that because it was like, I always, when I get in the car, I'm like, this is, I'm going out there for my clients. I am doing my very best for them. And like, I it, literally, when I get on the phone with an agent like that, I, lift myself up. I envision conquering this defeat for my clients and sure enough, it's going to be fixed. So, so yeah. let me ask you a question. And I love this. How and when did you become the lion? Because obviously you didn't, I mean, these are things that you learn over time. Like when do you totally. feel you became the lion? Um, when I first started, I knew I had to be a fierce negotiator. And when I first started, I couldn't negotiate to literally to save my life. I could not negotiate to save my life. It was so hard, but it was a muscle I knew I had to grow. So my husband's in sales and he and I work on that a lot. And we do objection handling a lot. And I I take in um, like Tom Ferry podcasts. I listen to these real estate folks that have made it and listen to their tenacity. And I envision myself like, oh, I could, I can be that. And I tell myself before I get on the phone with that agent, I am that. Yeah. I speak Love it. That. Love it. Love it, Cynthia. Um, you know, and, and, you know, talking about 
athletes and how they're prepping because I'm hearing a lot of these same things come up into this conversation. Um, you know, when, when you think about a basketball player, one of the biggest disconnects for a basketball player is the free throw line, right? They could, they could just kill it all day long and they get out there, they're under the pressure and they're like missing, right? They're, they're, they're missing. It's happened to you, Damian? Yeah, he said, he said, yeah, so right, that's a huge disconnect for a lot of basketball players. And so, um, you know, they've done studies and they've said, all right, let's take a group of basketball players and let's have them train with no ball for one hour, right? And they're going to sit here and they're going to visualize that ball going in the, in the hoop each time, in the hoop each time, in the hoop each time, and having that just be as, as important as people shooting that, shooting that, because they start to believe, because yeah, the potential is there. I know I can get that shot, but do I believe over and over in my head that that is possible? And so, Damian, let's talk about that. So, so he keeps raising his hand. I know he's got something to chime in on. No, this was a perfect segue for mine. So um, just last night, uh, it was my second game back in the 40 and over league, and I'm still like a, a year and some change out from qualifying for the league, but okay. I'm the exception on the team. Uh, but anyway, that's the thing that I – one of the things that I feel like is just second nature to me because I put in so much time and effort into it that even at this this age now in less physical ability than I've had, I'm still like a dog out there. And it's, it's the passion will never leave and nobody will ever tell me that I can't do it or that somebody else does it better than me. But also on the same lines that you're talking about with the free throw line, I also have that debilitation because like in high school, that's when it really started. My shooting ability just wasn't there like I was used to it being prior. And I shot horrible free throws. And that was the difference in my basketball career. That's why it didn't end up going further because I didn't take the time to overcome that doubt that I had in my mind. So I would step up to the free throw line and immediately just throw the ball. Like I wouldn't even attempt to make the shot because I was so I was I was so under the belief that I just couldn't do it. So I I didn't do it well. And now to this day, like I'm still trying to train my mind that I can do it better. And last night, as a matter of fact, I went one for two from the free throw line, which is good for me. 50 okay. percent. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's still a challenge overcoming your mind. It's not in it's not even the ability thing. Like you're saying, it's your mind telling you you can't do this. So, you know, don't Ooh. even don't even attempt. But. Yeah. But look what your mind told you. Your mind also told you that I'm in the 40s and I got this, right? Oh, yeah. I'm going to go out there and I'm, I'm going to play with the big dogs and I still got it, right? So oh, it's yeah. the same thing, right? If I was able to convince myself that I got this and no matter how old I am, I'm going to go out there and crush it. It's the same thing, right? Whatever self-talk that was, man, like that, tap into that therapist. And be like, hey, man, can we talk for a little bit? Because <laughs> I need to have a conversation with you. So Good stuff. PK, let's hear from you. What, what's your thoughts on this? So what's something you do with absolute certainty and conviction in your life? I think for me, it's definitely being um, an inspiration for to others. Um, I grew up in Iran and in Iran, we didn't really have a ton of role models or a ton of um you know, inspirations per se to want to grow up and be X, Y, and Z, or, you know, I was really good at playing the piano, but I never took it to that next level because why would I do that? What would I become? There was always these like limitations of like who you could be or like what life could look like. And then when I migrated here, I was almost 16 and suddenly I saw, holy shit, there's all these potentials and opportunities and all these role models and look at, you know, whatever industry you look into, there's somebody that is just like, you can look up to. And I just started developing a lot of, um, you know, the, the vision, the vi visualizing and all of that stuff. I started doing it when I was, you know, 16 and it actually started to change my life you know I, I left my parents in Iran and I was here alone not knowing what the heck I was doing with my life but I just kept on imagining what I wanted my life to be I just kept on you know having an image and that I just kept pushing forward and then you know I look back and I have been able to accomplish that so now whatever I do it's really just like 
trying to show others that you can do it too. And not in a fake way, because there's a lot of things that I know I can't, for example, like, you know, there are limitations to um, whether it's, you know, age or uh, some people are super talented and like um, in some ways, and maybe I haven't invested that much energy or time to doing it like the four mile, that's going to take me years to be able to, if, you know, I'm able to accomplish, but being able to inspire others, is like a very big uh, part of who I am. And I, I really lead with that. So a lot of my clients, when I talk to them, they're like, oh my gosh, like I want to be able to, um, you know, get into real estate. So I actually like, I guess, inspire them to want to get into real estate, <laughs> not necessarily buy it. Um, but I feel like that's where I just get really just excited. I'm just like, yeah, let's do it. Let's plan it. Let's, you know, um, get them into that level of you can do it too. Um, and, and that's probably my biggest, um, whatever you call like, power or strength it's that being able to inspire others in whatever i do mm, and you feel and you feel certain about that i do that's, that's like when i work out and I post I that, feel it. when i post my workouts like at the beginning a lot of people be, would like uh, close people would be like oh you know good for you um kind of like judgmental but then i saw a lot of people were like oh my gosh you're pushing me to get out of my house and work out thank you you know like if i wouldn't post they would be like i didn't work out today where's your workout video and i was like okay this is good like i'm inspiring others to get out there and work out um so yes i'm very certain about that i love that absolutely love it you know i was just thinking how many people are on the um, call today that are parents so, so being, being a parent, it's, it's, it's crazy. I was just thinking about this. Like there is no doubt in my mind that I am going to show up for my son every single day. There is no doubt in my mind. Like I am like, move, I got this, right? I feel like fucking like the, I am like super dad. That's how I feel, right? That's my son, right? Like I know I'm going to show up for him and do the best that I possibly can for him. So if I could believe that, you know, with certainty and conviction, then I can have that same belief with certainty and conviction about other areas of my life, because my mind is already doing it in one area of my life, I can do it in other areas of my life, because I've never been so certain about something in my life. Being a dad, like changed me forever, right? And it's just like, there's non negotiables, I wake up, and, and, and that is my life, right? And so the, it's a non negotiable. So just thinking about that, that's like, something that I know that no matter what, <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to do and, and, you know, the dads and the moms in the room. So let's go over to, to Joaquin. Joaquin, how about for you, my man? What's something that you do with absolute certainty and conviction? Uh, you know, uh, for me, I think it's just not quitting. I, I, that's like really embedded with me. And it has a lot to do probably from, you know, my beginnings, my humble beginnings, but, and then going into the service, right? I think that really kind of grew that muscle. Like don't quit no matter what, push through, follow through. And I, even now I tell my buyers, if you commit, I won't quit. The meaning we're going to see as many homes as possible. We're going to get you there. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And I think that's really helped me thus far. Um, and then just, you know, um, and actually just to kind of side note a little bit, I, I signed up for a triathlon. I've always wanted to do it. So in September, we're going to go for it. You know what I mean? And uh, right now, you know, I'm just really excited about that. That's going to be a really important um, kind of little check off on my bucket list. But yeah, I think that's something that's helped me throughout my career thus far. And I want to yeah. be able to kind of develop that muscle. Man, I love it. And so you said, like, take us back when you said like humble beginnings, it all started there. So like, when you could think back and like, close your eyes, like, what were the things that, that kind of sparked that at, a, at an early age? <laughs> Coming from nothing, you know, no. I, come, I come from a country that it was in the midst of a civil war when we came to the U.S., El Salvador. So I remember walking over, you know, dead bodies, you know, and asking my mom, like, what's that? Oh, they're sleeping, but <laughs> with a bunch of flies running, you know what I mean? So that right there just kind of and then seeing the strength, right, of my parents, my grandparents, you know, making that decision to just relocate. That's why to me, it's crazy when people say. I can't move because my kids schools or something like that. Like that to me, that's, that's, I don't get it. I mean, I get it. Right. Cause that's their, their world, but I just try to bring a perspective to that because how can people leave a country 
go to a different, right, where they don't know the language, they don't know the culture, they don't know nothing, but they know they're going to something better. And I try to bring that sometimes with some of the buyers too, to tell them, look, it doesn't matter, man, as long as you guys have a good home, look for positivity in your neighborhood, you'll be able to uh, be okay. Don't worry about that. That's very small compared to, you know, what's going on in the world. So that's kind of what I mean by humble beginnings. Man, I, I mean, and to think about that, this is the land of immigrants, right? My my family came over from, um, you know, from a port in Sicily and landed in Ellis Island and, you know, came into New York, right? And traveled on this boat, you know, across the seas to this new country to start a better life for themselves and figure it out and try to develop commerce and new businesses and all these things that really helped thrive our country at the time. So it's just like, yeah, man, I get it. You know, those humble roots, man. It's like people came here with nothing and built empires for their families. But sometimes we have to take those risks, right? Like, like PK was saying, and you know, my family came from, you know, Mexico and from Italy. And so, yeah, man, that's, that's really good stuff, dude. Really good, good angle to think about, dude. Anything else you want to share on that? Just grateful to be here. You guys are awesome. Cool, brother. Cool. I love it. Let's hear from Angela. So Angela, how about for you? Because um, I, I want to know, what did you always have this sense of, of energy and excitement and conviction? Um, so, so, so let's talk a little bit about like, you know, what, what in your life makes you certain in conviction and have conviction? Um, I'm definitely the mom. Like if I can do anything with certainty, it's my babies. Like don't, and, I, and it just brings me joy. Do they drive me crazy? Yes. Do I drink because of them? Yes. Do I love them? Absolutely. Okay. It is the weirdest thing I've ever felt. But I do see that play over to my clients. I am the person who takes care of everything. Um, little background. I don't have parents. So to me, becoming a parent was like, oh, no one taught me what to do here. Like, so I was so fearful of it that when it finally happened, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. It's still hella hard, <laughs> but it was everything I ever wanted. And now I probably overdo it. Like I have my mother-in-law and I still, I'm the one that gets up and serves everybody. All, every family dinner is at my house, every Thanksgiving, every Christmas is at my house. So I'm the one that takes on the family and takes care of everybody. And that follows over to my clients. And if that's something I can do, like, if you're ever hurt, come talk to me. I will always push you to be better and happier and tell you that, hey, shit happens, but life will always work out. Like, that's what I'm strong in. And I don't ever doubt that. Like, that I feel 100%. But no, I've not always been like that. So it's, who was that? Who was that person for you? Since you're that person for others? <sighs> My husband. Like, he really... <laughs> I'm one of those people, it takes really a long time to kind of get to know the inside and what made me become me. Mm. And he took years trying to get to that and he never gave up. And he just always like, he's very supportive and he always pushed me like, hey, you can do anything you set your mind to. Um, and we're both, um, he, you know, we're both first gens here. So like he watched his parents and he didn't learn English until he was like in third grade. So he's always wow. like, oh, you can do this, trust me. But it definitely, it's a work in progress. And every day I still work on it. That's why I'm one of those people. If I have a negative thought, three positives come right after. Like mm. I refuse to allow myself to be like that. Wow. Good yeah. stuff, Angela. Love it. Absolutely love it. Mel, I know you're driving, but I'm, I'm sure you're chomping at the bit and probably wanted to hop in on this one. Do you have a second? Yeah, absolutely. That was beautiful, Angela. I really, really- We can't hear you. Your audio, hear you. audio is super, audio is super low. Super, super low. Can you hear me now? Yep, perfect. So I was just saying that was beautiful, Angela. I really loved that. Thank you for sharing that. That totally makes me feel like listening to you makes me feel like that's the type of mom that I want to be. Like I have dreams of hosting these like big, huge, like family parties and making family meals every night and like having, you know, all the holidays at my house and just like being that catalyst for those that are around me. And that person for me was my mom. And weirdly, like my dad, they kind of played off of each other a lot growing up. But like a little tidbit about me that's like really personal and not a lot of people know this about me was that I was born in LA and my dad, my real biological father, or what people like to call a sperm donor, he was an entertainer. 
And so he was a Persian singer and he came here in the 60s and he ended up being one of the biggest Persian entertainers in Southern California in LA. And he created, by the time I was age five, something called Melody Studios, which is a complete production studio all across Southern California that he now owns. Unfortunately, that was his priority as a father growing up was entertaining and being out on tour in Europe until three, four o'clock in the morning while my mom was raising me at home. And so he wasn't that much of a dad or a father, but he loved us very, very, very much. And he still does today. But growing up, you know, um, my mom ended up divorcing him and then she ended up remarrying a completely different person who ended up raising me. So that's my dad. That's my father. He ended up, you know, buying me my first bike growing up. He stitched up my first scrape on my knee. He bought me my first dog and my first horse. Like he was just like the best dad I could have ever had. And he also built something completely different and came here as an immigrant in 1972, left his family back in Iran and like married my mom and took me on as his own and like totally raised me and loved every little piece of me. And even like, you know, helped me out when I got in trouble in high school and got into my first car accident. Like he was my dude. Right. And ended up, you know, teaching me a lot about just people creating something out of nothing my parents came here as immigrants i'm a first generation american as well and they ended up creating something out of nothing both of my dads went into completely two different directions right and um they created beautiful things in their life and just seeing that growing up um made me feel like i want to create something amazing too not only for other people but just for myself right? Because they ultimately created these beautiful lives for themselves. Um, and so I just want to be able to like lead by example and create um, just a beautiful life. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. And let's uh, let's give it up for Mel because she's actually covering, covering for Carmen. Carmen is in uh, Mexico right now for the EXP event. And so we had asked Melody to step up and cover the squad meeting today. So she's going to... Uh, run her first official fast real estate squad meeting today so super stoked for you make sure that you record it and send us the recording i'm i'm, I'm excited to watch it so you guys uh, you know tons of great stuff coming out of this conversation today when we talk about you know what roger bannister accomplished and how he accomplished and then what happened following suit you know two years after that 37 people accomplished that i put the link in the um the chat box watch that video when you guys have a chance it's a really quick video it kind of broke down um you know this this diagram a little bit further in detail but I, a couple of things that i want you guys to know that um you know we all have the potential you know but is your potential backed by solid actions that are going to lead to the results but are you guys truly truly believing in the things that you're doing with certainty and conviction do you feel that you have done everything that you possibly need to do to put yourself in a state of certainty once you achieve that state of certainty it's a beautiful thing i, I believe in myself when i'm dealing with a client that if I'm on a buyer's consultation, I believe with certainty that I'm going to connect with this person and build rapport. Like no matter what, I'm gonna connect with this person to get them on my side. But that's something that I, it's, it's ingrained in me. I truly, truly believe that I have an ability to connect with people. So like, there's never a thought of doubt in my mind. It's just when, when is it gonna happen? Oh, it didn't happen right then, but watch. Well, watch, I'm gonna get them on my side soon, soon. So it's just a matter of when. I never doubt myself walking into a presentation ever. I don't, and I'm not, that's not sounding pompous at all. That's not meaning to sound pompous. That's just, I know. I just know that I have the ability to connect with people because it's about them. When you make it about them, then great things will happen, right? This isn't about us. This is all about them. Just like this company isn't about Kenny and I, this company is about you guys. This is about each of you flourishing in your own regard. So I want to go around the room. I want to hear from some people about what were some of your takeaways today. So Melissa, let's hear from you. We won't be able to go through everybody, but I can go through the room uh, to quite a few people. So Melissa, what were some of your takeaways from today's sesh? Um, it's just a good reminder because I think, you know, I've definitely had times in my life where that certainty just literally make something appear in front of you with like no effort, except for that there was effort. It just felt effortless, right? And mm -hmm. I think that I've just kind of lost that. So it's good reminder to get back into just that like singular focus. 
Totally. I love it. I love it. Good stuff. Um, let's go over to Amber. Amber, are you are or Sylvia, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. All right. I know Sylvia's working. Uh, Martinique, let's go over to you. Takeaways from today's sesh. Um, just remembering where I come from and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. everybody's story just touched me and you know it's just we all sound like we come from humble beginnings and we're still fighting and staying committed and I just was reminded of that today so thank you everybody for sharing your story good stuff Ryan how about for you for a few takeaways from today's sesh um I really appreciate everyone sharing I learned some new stuff about people I had no idea about um for me my my biggest takeaway is um I feel like we kind of dived into this in another morning training, but really being able to take yourself back to a time when you were operating at your highest, right? And how can we all translate that into our business? Um, you know, just like Damien, for me, it, it was basketball. I, I never made my varsity basketball team, but you couldn't tell me shit when I was playing pickup with the varsity dudes at school. And I would smoke them, you know what I mean? Um, so there, I think all of us thinking back to that time and really bringing it full full circle will just help us in business, our personal life, uh, you know, everything. So that was my takeaway. Good stuff, good stuff. Kevin, how about for you, a few takeaways from today's sesh? Yeah, no, I just really appreciate uh, just this, this forum that everybody feels comfortable sharing really personal stuff with. I, I, I really enjoy getting to know all you guys more. Um, you know, for me, yeah, I think Ryan kind of hit on the head. It brought me back to some memories of some really peak athletic performances in my career. And then um, uh, I've had a couple of really good business uh, successes, but uh, one that I, I had forgotten about. And uh, it was great to be able to kind of go back to um, that mindset and really just remember that, um, you know, I, we, we had this we had this event that we put on in downtown Pleasanton, similar to kind of what Patrick's, but not to 120,000. It was more like 50,000. And, uh, you know, it just brought me back there. And we were like, you know, we will do anything we can to make this a huge success. Too many people depend on us to make this happen. And it was just me and a partner. And then we had like 150 volunteers, right? So it was, uh, it was good to, uh, to kind of go back there. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Love it. Love it, brother. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Chris, how about for you? Some takeaways from today's sesh. A few. Um, I mean, I, I definitely appreciate everybody sharing. Um, kind of like Melissa said, it was it's definitely a reminder uh, that that we do have things we can be certain of, right? We're we're in such an uncertain industry, and a lot of what we do on a daily basis can be uncertain. Um, but there are things that we are are good at and practice at, and we just have to remind ourselves of that. And um, so yeah, just a reminder for me that there are things that we can be certain of. Um, and you know, everybody here, I think has also inspired me to be uh, the best parent I can be as well. You guys are awesome. Yeah. I love that brother, I love that. We all have a mountain, right? We all have a snowboarding mountain, right? Whatever context that is in your life, we all have a snowboarding mountain. When, when you get off that lift and you're looking down at a double black diamond, you're not just like, I, I could walk this down. No, I'm, I'm going to tear this mountain up, right? I might I might fall a little bit, but I'm going to fall and I'm going to get right back up. And the end goal is getting down to the bottom. And so we all have our own mountain, right? So it's like, what's that look like for you? Cynthia, takeaways from today's sesh. Um, Come on, boomer. <laughs> a boomer moment. Oh my gosh. Um, a lot. Holy cow. That this has been one of my favorites, I think. Um, takeaways are, I mean, if someone out there can run a four minute mile, so can I, right? I mean, that if you guys, if we can all do this, I mean, it just, it gives me so much strength to hear these stories and it makes me feel like I want to go conquer the day. That to me is just super powerful. So thank you guys for sharing. Awesome, awesome. You know, it's like, look around at your team members that are, you know, you know, some of the top producers in the company, like they didn't get there overnight, right? They didn't get there overnight, but they have the potential. They backed it up with great actions. They had the results of being a top producer now because they believed that this was possible. 
they believed that they were going to change their lives and they were going to change families' lives, right? They believe that with so much certainty and conviction, it's led to their success. They don't believe I'm going to make a lot of money. That's a byproduct, right? The money is a byproduct, right? If you believe so much in this industry that I'm truly going to go out there and change my life, my children's life, God bless you, and change families' lives, that's going to push you. And the byproduct is going to be, I'm going to make probably some really good money at doing so, and I'm going to feel really good about my job. So if you look around, there's people on the team and that are, are truly, truly reaching you know, success that you want to be at ultimately, then, then know that it can be done, right? But it could be done your way right? Their path was their path. But at the end of the day, no matter what, and what will always be the common denominator between all of us is the true belief in self, right? And so I want you guys to walk away with that. I think as we move forward, most of our Mondays are going to be a little bit more structured like this. We'll get further into like role playing scripts and stuff like that, more business. But I think that I think it's all about full circle, right? This game is about mind, body, and soul. And I think like the conversations that we're having, I just want to thank each of you for being my accountability people, right? I'm up early. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm writing down and, and looking in all these books and notes and stuff like that. So like, I just appreciate you guys helping to be my accountability people because I'm learning so much about you guys. And like I said, this, this journey is about your journey. And now uh, we're just here to support you into the journey to where you're already going and maybe help you make some tweaks along the way. So let's get out there and absolutely crush our week. Let's go out there and make sure we're staying focused on our goals, track your guys' stuff and see you, hold yourself accountable, put your name in lights. Um, we're going to see you guys tomorrow for the meeting, but if you need anything throughout the day, uh, just let me know. But just wanted to tell you guys that I really, really appreciate all the work that you're doing in these sessions. And uh, you guys go out there and be the fierce lions that you are. So thanks for putting that, Cynthia. So have a great day, everyone. Crush it. Thank you.